Hey guys, it's Jim at Crawfordology. We're back after Independence Day and we're looking forward to talking to you about the things that are going on in the country, the Second Amendment, the gun laws, all the craziness. Stay tuned. Hey guys, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at ThreatWorks, and it's really fitting that we're talking about the folks at ThreatWorks today because this is a show that will be, for the most part, dedicated to Second Amendment and your Second Amendment rights. As many of you know, I have ownership interest in ThreatWorks, and look, th there are lots of cool things that you can do with ThreatWorks. You can do hydro dip, seracoding, laser engraving, uh, really just some great stuff. So if, if you need something done, if you're trying to protect your weapon so that it can protect you, call the folks at, at Threat, ThreatWorks and they will, um, the guys like Nick and Justin, they're experts on this, Joel, they will help you get squared away. Okay, so right into it today, I want to take a look at just, let's look at the verbiage on the Second Amendment. And here we go. <clears throat> so, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So, you know, this is probably one of the most debated parts of the Bill of Rights. It's the second bill. It's, it's the Second Amendment. Um, and, and here it is <clears throat> helping us. You know, the first 10, first 10 amendments are called the Bill of Rights. Um, ironic that it was Virginia that put these Bill of Rights together. And now we have some politicians in Virginia who are very progressive. And, and let me talk to you just for a second, because this is really important to understand. Sometimes people wonder, why is it that some of us read this wording one way and other people see it completely differently? And it's possible for two logical people to still have differences of opinion. It's, it's also possible that you can have two legitimate opinions and and one of them are wrong or both of them are wrong or neither of them are going to accept that that they're wrong. So so when our founders were were developing this idea of a social compact, right? There was a contract between citizens and those inalienable rights that are given to you by God. So uh, of course, you know that that in their day this is what uh, Locke was talking about, that, hey, when you woke up in the morning, you had a set of rights, uh, when you were born, rather, you had a set of rights uh, just by being placed on the earth. And, and here, to be part of a government, you have to accept, you have to agree that you're going to give that government some authority over you and some control of those rights. And the way you do that is, is by being a good citizen. So um, for the first hundred years of our country, um, this was pretty much the accepted practice. In fact, when you see Abraham Lincoln and he's speaking at Gettysburg, he's really talking back to that preamble portion of the, the Constitution and, and certainly of, uh, rather, of the De Declaration of Independence and, and the Constitution, the founding documents. But when you come in line to Teddy Roosevelt, who, who, by the way, was a Republican, so I'm just going to tell you there are progressives on both sides. Um, Teddy Roosevelt started to buy into this European idea. And this European idea was that, hey, we have come a long way. The protections against our government that we had in the first uh, 100 years of our country, we no longer have to worry about governments doing bad things to their people or taking advantage of their people. So we've, we've moved beyond that, we've grown beyond that, but now we have to be willing to give up and put the person, the individual, has to take a second seat to society. So the ideas went from being, I have inalienable rights that were given to me by God, to that's not really important, and you have to, you, you have to subscribe to whatever the ideas are of the community to be part of that community. So basically what's happening is the Europeans believe that, you know, the world has changed. Now, here's what happened in, in America at that time. The Europeans had the best schools. So even if you were raised here in, in America, you were likely going to go abroad 
to be educated. Um, Johns Hopkins here in the U.S. was a German-planted school that was brought here to teach these German ideas. Well, the German ideology was that the human is subservient to the community. So that means that you don't have inalienable rights. You have to adapt yourself to live and be a good human, uh, to be part of that society. So these are competing ideas that, that struggle with the founding document. Now, here's where I really have a problem with this. The founding document is really clear on inalienable rights, right? So at the, it, it, at the very beginning of the Declaration, we're saying, hey, these are the truths that we hold to be self-evident right and yet there are with a hundred years going by people accepting that governments never do bad things there are never factions so let's talk about a faction for a second because these are important things to understand it's important to understand how this ties back to your founding documents so factions unlike what you probably think of a faction today it could just be a group of people factions and the tyranny of the majority would come when you had a group of people, factions come in two flavors, majority and minority, and these, these majority factions have a desire to take something from you without your consent. So it could be your gun rights. It could be your right to free speech. It could be your right to assemble. It could be you know the right that you have to protest your government or, or to uh, redress complaints in court. So factions come about when a group of people have control of the system and they say, we are going to make everybody do this. So some people uh, take the approach, by the way, and, and this has become more common lately, that elections have consequences. We hear this frequently. And currently in Virginia, we have a faction in power that wishes to take control of many of the firearms laws many of those social compacts that were created in the original founding documents and they want to change those things so the faction is usually checked by checks and balances number number one and and two uh, amongst our founders was the idea that when they created the system they did a couple of things that was unlike any republic before and they divided power, so there was a separation of powers. You couldn't have a, a Caesar come out of this because the power was divided and there were equally powerful arms that could join together to take down a Caesar. Uh, so, so divisions of power, separation of power created, created three factions, right? And the press, uh, through, through the freedoms, created a fourth faction even. And these groups would compete in power uh, our founders were smart enough to know that leaders and politicians are ambitious people and they're going to want to take more and more. Now, there is another uh, check that they put in place and that was that was not just separations of power, but they had the checks and balances that each of those separate arms of government could provide. So each of them, uh, for example, you know, your federal government was, was able uh, through either the judiciary to have the, the judicial arm say this, this is compliant with the founding documents, the Constitution. The executive branch could, could do enforcement and the legislative branch could create laws. So, so there was separation, checks and balances designed to keep us together. But I, I think it's interesting to find out, and, and I'll tell you, I'm doing this study with Hill, Hillsdale uh, College in Michigan, and it is really exceptional on the Constitution. I suggest anybody go and, and do this. You will, you will hear a lot of what I'm saying echoed there. It is very thoughtful. It's very well delivered. So here's the next thing. Is our founders said, hey, we really don't want just those checks and balances, just the separation of powers. We see those as auxiliary functions. These are, these are auxiliary protections to your rights. And they said the number one right, the number one protection was you, was, was the citizen. And they never imagined, I can't, I, I, I say they never imagined, I can't imagine myself that they felt like, hey, we've gone to all this trouble to build this, this uh, uh, republic. We've, we've got this, uh, this great government, this great test that's never been done before quite like we're doing it. And I can't imagine that they ever thought 
that every single voter would not play an active role, that they would not be running down there to say, man, I can't believe it. I get, I get to have some control, some say in my life. Um, but we know that that's the way it is, right? Turnout was very low uh, this, past, uh, this past year for primaries. And uh, some of it, of course, was COVID-19 related. Sometimes it's just people are disenfranchised by the system. They don't believe in it. However, back to the story. So now you get these factions like we have in Virginia. We have a faction in the House. So all three houses, well, I say all three, the bicameral legislation here in, in the, general, the Virginia General Assembly is controlled by Democrats, upper and lower house. The executive branch is, is controlled by a Democrat governor. So these two acting in, in tandem or in corporation can create laws and pass them on their own accord. Now, when they get to the to judicial review, and this is, you know, there's already been in this this past General Assembly a number of lawsuits filed. But when they get to that point, we'll see if the judges put these things in check and say that's not constitutional. But that's a long ride, right? That is like getting on the roller coaster at one of these amusement parks and you really can't get off the roller coaster mid-ride. You've got to ride that all the way to the end to see how, how the ride went. And that's the way the judicial, it moves slow and, and it's intentional and thoughtful. So you can lose a lot of liberties in, say, the six years it takes to get something from its original court case up to potentially a Supreme Court. And there are all sorts of things and tactics and strategies that smart lawyers have, have developed to, um, to keep those things from going there. So we see in gun cases right now in the U.S. Supreme Court, any time that the liberal folks put, up, put together a law and they think they're going to lose, they pull it back. And, and when they pull it back, they, they basically say to the, to the court, oh, we think it's wrong, we're going to fix it. And when they do that, it takes away the authority of the court. So the court doesn't really project power into the possible future. It simply acts on cases that are before it. So, so here is a, a situation where we have activist folks in both houses and an activist in the executive branch in Virginia. And the desire is, despite what we just read in, in that Second Amendment, the desire is to take uh, and make some changes. So I want to go, before we do this, because I'm talking a lot about the Democrat side, Democrats today are the most progressive uh, of, of the groups. Again, like I pointed out, there are Republican progressives. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, 1901 to 1909 as president, was a progressive. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, 1912, progressive. Uh, so um, there, there have been folks both, uh, and, and there's a point of both Democrat and Republican, uh, but both sides where you will find folks who believe that maybe we should change the Constitution. And this is where that whole idea of having the Constitution as a living document um, that became the, the dream of progressives. Well, you know, what they wrote back then really doesn't apply to us today. But I think it's really worth noting that here's a faction they imagined it back in 1770s, and yet we have we have a solution for it. And and the solution, although it may not get there as quickly as we want, there is a solution. You and I are the first solution, and that is voting. That is pushing these folks out and, and reversing, making them know <clears throat> that they will be held accountable. So let's go. I, what I want you to see next is today in Richmond, there was a gathering of of armed folks, and and let's just let's just scroll scroll up. I want to make sure they can see the title here. So, uh, demonstrators shift focus uh, during Senator Lead's Second Amendment rally. So, here you have some Black Lives Matters folks with a Republican candidate for governor in Virginia, Amanda Chase. So, so what's interesting about this, and, and that was changed. I, I want you to see that this was a very well-represented group in, in terms of the makeup of Virginia. We have a large number of minorities. 
We have a large number of whites. And, and the folks are here having a really good dialogue. And what I noticed, and, and I'm not going to, you can, you can go find this on 12 on your side if you want to watch this. Um, I'm not going to play it for you here. But what I'll tell you is, is that a remarkable thing happens when people realize that their rights are being infringed upon. They don't really care the politics. And I think our governor would be wise, as, as would the General Assembly be wise, to reconsider any um, shedding of those rights and, and, and the protection over our rights uh, on a whim. Because I think there will be rep repercussions that, uh, that are far and wide. So here is a, a, a very interesting approach. The governor comes in. He wants to take the guns he wants to do, let's just actually, let's have a look at what what uh, the governor is hoping to do. So right here is um, is the list of items that uh, didn't get done in, in House Bill 961 uh, by Levine. And so repeal reciprocity with 25 states. So concealed carry permits um, happen in a way that it makes it most convenient for you. Imagine it's like your driver's license. You're able to take your driver's license issued in Virginia and drive in all 50 states without having, you know, some policeman somewhere pull you over and say, sorry, we don't allow Virginians to drive here. You'll, you'll have to get a New Mexico driver's license. Reciprocity with handguns is very similar. Uh, 25 states currently, and, and we used to lead this, by the way, we used to have uh, the most concealed carry reciprocity uh, actions. Now we're down, we're not really up there at, at the top, but we're down to 25. Shut down indoor shooting ranges. Now, being completely transparent, we are in the process of planning and building an indoor shooting range. Uh, it's significant in size, it's significant in investment. Not only does it support the police, uh, you know, the law enforcement community, uh, the public, and the military, but it is a real needed um, shift here in Hampton Roads. It, it provides something that doesn't exist. It provides a, a platform and a place for people to learn about firearms. Just this month in Virginia, 81,000 purchases of new firearms. Now, I was on the phone earlier this morning with uh, a couple of, uh, couple of guys who are very involved in ranges all around the country. Uh, very involved in gun safety all over. And and some of the early numbers estimate that up to 90% of those sales are from first-time gun owners. So I just want to pose the question, where do you want first-time gun owners to learn to shoot? Would you like them to go in their backyard? Would you like them to have to use it the first time somebody's breaking into their house? Or would you like them to have a range, an indoor range, where they can do it safely? where they can have training, where people are supervising and watching and helping them. So let's go back to the list. So continuing with, with the list, there are uh, proof of training to purchase a gun. So no longer can you take a course online to understand basic safety. You know, again, it may be something that we like. It, it may be something that we don't feel we want our government uh, providing, but uh, it is nonetheless. Conviction convictions for various misdemeanors as hate crimes will rescind gun rights. So now this is interesting because we're going to get to another bill later, and I want you to pay attention that, so convictions for various misdemeanors as hate crimes will rescind gun rights. By the way, hate crimes are determined by locality, and, and you see this happening now, that hate crimes are anything, if, if people become infuriated and throw what's deemed to be a racial slur, that can be a hate crime. Um, and racial slurs are, again, not obvious to everyone. Um, there are, depends on how you were raised, what, what you were raised with. You may mean nothing more than just you know it's a bad word. But look, I'm not, I'm not supporting that. I'm just simply not supporting that we create a, another category of crime. Um, okay, so 10% tax on guns and ammunition. So one of the things that uh, supposedly the governor has said is if he can't stop them from buying them, he's going to tax them so that uh, they can't afford them. And no open carry in vehicles. So if you aren't open carry in vehicle in a vehicle, 
this this basically means you could be the armed person who gets taken out by a carjacker because you couldn't get to your weapon. Um, there are lots of different ways to to ensure safety. Uh, it's it. it these rules just don't make a lot of sense sometimes. Make it illegal to have guns in state or local government buildings. Guess what? That will be the number one target for bad people. So if you want to see mass shootings, remember what happened when we did that and we made it so that you couldn't have guns in schools. Some schools in some parts of the country uh, have shooting teams. Some schools in parts of the country used to have uh, kids who were from you know farm country. They like to hunt after school, and they'd bring their hunting uh, shotgun, their bows and arrows, and have them in their truck, in their vehicle, and their, while they were in school. When they got out of school, they'd be out in the field. Um, most places have already made that illegal. Now you can't have guns in a state or government building. Make it illegal to have guns in the Capitol Square. Uh, this is the site, by the way, where you saw the January Lobby Day rally, uh, where for some reason there were... I don't know, thousands of people up there peacefully assembled, and now they've just deemed that that wasn't right. I don't know what what got them upset about this because they apparently didn't give a damn when people were tearing, tearing down the statues and setting buildings on fire. But for you to go up and lawfully carry a rifle around, that's too much. Um, they didn't even enforce uh, you know, the, the rules when the counter protesters were out there and and looking at uh, trashing i mean i there were probably 50 violations that you could you could choose not just the the tearing down of the uh, of the statues but the the graffiti the trash the garbage all the things that happened there just the destruction of of property the assaults um, gun stores can't hire anyone who's been legally prohibited from owning a firearm even as a janitor or stock boy so, so basically, it's another restriction. Hey, we know you went to jail, you did your time, but you're not allowed to own a gun. We don't even want you working around them. We don't even want you to look at them or say the word gun. So, so what you have to ask yourself, is this really the world we want to live in? Do we trust someone like Governor Northam? Do we trust somebody like the General Assembly to make a decision today? I, I will tell you, I don't know of, of anyone in Richmond that I would say is more equipped than our founding fathers were to lay out a plan and what our our local politicians and and our uh, our current politicians rather are deciding is that uh, they know better about that bill of rights than uh, than the folks who wrote them uh, they don't care that they were written by by virginians uh, so many things that they're doing here are in in conflict with um, with good governance, and they're more about control. Now, this goes back to that bigger discussion. So when you're thinking about how people are going to respond to us as a population, our first rule, according to the founders, we are the first protection on those constitution, <clears throat> pardon me, constitutional rights, those, uh, the Bill of Rights, we are the guys, we're the protectors, we're the ones who the torch has been passed to. Uh, so I see constantly on social media, I see constantly on the news, I hear it from friends, we're not going to let this happen, we're going to fight it, we're going to do this, but I'm telling you, it takes more than empty words, it takes action, and we want to put together something in Richmond, we need to get there yet this month, because next month, this thing will be like a fast-moving train. Uh, they will go in light, you know, ready to go when they have their special session. They will turn the lights off, lock the doors, and make a vote, and push it out, and there you will be. Um, we have to consider what the impact will be long term. Many of you think throw the bums out. Hey, when we throw them out, we still have to undo this. That means we have to have majorities in all, all of those houses, both houses, plus the executive branch, to to resend these things. So once they are done, it is like an arrow. It is it is shot and you can't get it back. So you've got to be active on it today. You need to call. So tomorrow we're going to have a, a another broadcast. We're going to share with you. We're going to share all of the uh, contact numbers for your senators, your representatives here in Virginia and the governor's office. We'll even create a form letter 
but we need you to participate. You've got to do more than just talk about it. You've got to be active. Your founding fathers relied on you to do this, right? They fought the war. They fought the revolution. They turned back, you know, the strongest, most powerful nation in the world and, and created a new country, a new idea and, and, a, and a new type of Republican democracy. It's up to us to maintain it and to keep it, and it's up to you to keep it in this generation and pass it to the next. So if we ignore this, we are going to lose these things so fast, we won't know what, what's hit us. Um, all right, next story. So I want to go to, um, re remember here, we had that discussion a little bit earlier. So the next thing that, uh, that they're pushing is about the, this is the Senate Democratic Caucus Police Reform and Crim Criminal Justice Equity Plan. So there is a, a whole series of things that they are trying to do. Again, special session is going to have this push through. So, so what our founders also counted on was that the Senate, the high, you know, the the uh, the smaller uh, representative body would be the more deliberative body. It would be the the body that would pause and think and carefully consider the impact of things. What we have now is a group of populists who simply want to be loved. If if these folks were YouTubers or uh, you know, Facebook heroes, they would be all about just getting the clicks. I just need somebody to love me. So they put out things that they believe are popular or popular to a group. And that's what is constantly pushed out in, in front of us. And they'll do it in a way that uh, makes it appear to be as reasonable as they can package it. But they hardly ever think about those second and third order effects. You know, what do I mean by that? So if, if I make a decision today and it has some different impact two weeks from today, I need to think through those things before I jump into making this decision. If I jump out of the airplane and I realize I'm without a parachute, that's, that's an effect. If I jump out of the airplane and I realize I have a parachute but I'm over the ocean, in the middle of the ocean, and there's nothing, you know, no place for me to land, that's another that's another second order effect. So I have to be considerate and think not just what happens after I land in the ocean. Is there a boat there that I'm going to get in? Is there a target I can land on? Am I going to be safe? If I, if I don't land, if I jump out without a parachute, is there something soft? Uh, I don't know if you remember the guy who jumped out and landed in the, in the big uh, balloon. So when, when our deliberative body is looking at something, it's their job to really consider all of these effects. Right now, and, and what our founders would have fought against is the passions, right? The passions of the moment, us fighting and just making snap decisions based on the because. You know, George Floyd was mistreated by those police, therefore all police are bad, and we make all sorts of crazy decisions that impair the police department's ability to do their job in the future. It, it doesn't... Uh, admonish the perpetrator of, of, you know, George Floyd's death. It admonishes every policeman simply for being a police officer. And, and of course, you know, around the country, around the world, if you visit the jails, you'll find many of the prisoners in the jails believe they are not guilty. So um, some, some people joke and quip that there are no guilty people in the jails. If you just ask, just ask them. Um, that's not the case, of course. We know that. We know that people do bad things, and we need we need a police department that can enforce our laws and can protect us. Uh, by the way, I don't know. This is a mixed bag for um, for the governor because if he creates all these gun laws and then does all these bad things uh, to the police departments, uh, including there's a, a an offering of defunding if they believe you have uh, you've been too forceful. Uh, Who's going to enforce those laws? Who who's coming out to uh, to take your guns to uh, collect that ten percent tax and make sure you don't uh, overthrow what you believe is a despot in uh, in Richmond? So we have to really think carefully about how we're going to respond in a moment where our passions are high and it's best to let some time pass, take a deep breath, come into the next session. But that's that decision's been made. There is a special session. You've got to get active. You've got to pay attention because it's going to have 
uh, catastrophic effects on how our country is managed. Once Virginia becomes, if you think of Virginia as, as the cradle of our, our country, right? Yorktown, just a, a few miles from our studio, the last major battle of, of the revolution, uh, the birthplace of Washington, Jefferson, uh, the birthplace of the country is the largest colony. Uh, where Virginia went, that's where the rest of the country went. And now we have here in Virginia a group of people that would not only roll back the, the thoughtful, developed insights of our founders, but would also take your liberties and, and do it with little consideration or care because they believe they have a progressive mandate from voters in Northern Virginia. All right, guys, listen, stay tuned. We're going to have a lot more on this. And, and we don't like talking about guns all the time. I, I just want you to understand that even though we're in the gun business, it's not that we love talking about guns, but we do love talking about your rights and we love talking about the things that you care about. And we think this is one of those things. All right. Have a good night and take care.